Hey folks, the Field and Garden Podcast is honored to be partnering with the Growing for Market magazine. They have been publishing practical ideas and information for direct market flower and vegetable growers for over 31 years. All the articles are written by farmers who get their hands dirty and know what they're doing. The magazine is still on the same mission as when the Flower Farmer book author Lynn Bozinski founded this magazine back in 1992 to connect growers with the best ideas from other growers. There is dedicated flower content in every magazine. A decade's worth of back issues and over 1,600 archived articles from writers like Aaron Benzenkang, Gretel Adams, Pamela and Frank Arnowski, and Jonathan and Megan Leese, all available on the website. With 10 new issues every year available on paper, digital, or both, you're guaranteed to find something to fine tune your farm and growing for market. So if you do farmer's markets, CSA, farm stands, pick your own florist sales, or wholesaling, whether you're a commercial grower or you just want to grow like one, subscribe to Growing for Market for the nitty gritty details of growing, marketing, and the business of local farming. And I have a special offer for you. Use the coupon code WORKSHOP to get 25% off any subscription to the original Farmer to Farmer magazine at growingformarket.com. Hey friends, welcome back to the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your host and friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and Happy New Year still. I'm all about the new year throughout the whole month of January, y'all. So, um, glad everybody is dropped in for a little visit, and I appreciate you being here. And today, you know, I had previously mentioned that I would kind of be sharing as things were unfolding here this year. The episodes are going to perhaps, not everyone, but kind of be based on what I'm doing and what I'm thinking about in that process of the business. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks this morning about, I actually read a, a social media post yesterday in my closed Facebook group for my students. And they were all, you know, as we all are concerned about the economy and, um, you know, the way things are going, which we're just, it's on a hamster wheel, y'all. I mean, it just, this happens every, I don't know how many years, but I have been through it once before, um, the economic downturn, the housing bubble busted and everybody crashed. But anyway, that's not what I want to talk about. What the question was, their concern and what what strategies were their were their fellow students thinking about as we head into this year and i it just dawned on me that i would just share on here um kind of what my model was of my business and y'all i wasn't i'm not going to take any credit for being so smart that i figured this out this is kind of just how it evolved, I guess, for several reasons, looking back that I can see, but it served me so well. And so I've named this episode, Simplicity Equaled Success. And it really is the root of kind of how I was able to scale my small urban farm um, as much as possible and to do it without, my goodness, without a whole lot of extra bells and whistles. Um, so before we jump into that, I just want to first off thank you all for your support. If you have um, ever reviewed us, liked us, shared us, bought from us, become a student, this is my deepest heartfelt thanks to thank you for allowing me to continue doing um, what just makes my heart go pitter-patter. 
I still pop out of bed every day after 25 years. This is my 25th year, y'all. I just realized that. Wow. I still pop out of bed. You know, there are definitely days that have problems that are full of things that I do not want to do, things that 10 years ago I would have never even dreamed that I was able to face and do. You know, decisions, telling people something they don't want to hear, um, those types of things. So I thank you all for your support. And the Gardener's Workshop crew, which I can't believe what that's become, but gathering people that have the same focus as I do and passion of either gardening or farming and growing flowers and doing it without um, pesticide intervention and herbicides and, you know, just sharing that joy and making it possible for other people is what the common denominator is in our crew. And that is all possible because of your support. And this I thank you for. So friends, if you're new here, um, you may not even know about all of that. You can head over to the gardenersworkshop.com. Um, that is our platform. It is a online garden shop, online library of courses, tons of free resources. Um, you'll find our blog there, um, our sister podcast, Seed Talk, um, and just so much more. And so we appreciate it when the time comes that you need something, you want to expand your knowledge, or you need seeds, or you need a book, um, or a tool, or a supply, you think of us. We appreciate it. So back to the story, friends. So my farm and success, um, I think, and I, I really felt kind of, you know how I, you may have heard me say before how I always felt like not a real farmer because I couldn't have hoop houses and structures and, you know, I, I wasn't a grown-up farmer is kind of what I felt like. Well, I would also feel that way when I would go to, even later in my career, when I would go to conferences and um, be talking with my grower friends and they're all growing um, these crops that just weren't natural growers for me, meaning I would have had to input a lot of structure and a lot of extra work and a lot of extra labor, aka more money, um, to grow them. Um, because I am a 100% outdoor garden grower. I'm like a gardener gone wild on steroids, y'all. I grow everything outside in a garden just like a gardener does. I just grow a lot more of it on a very giant, supersized scale, right? So here is the lowdown on what I did. And what I was getting at is that I literally grew fewer crops and grew more of them. And the reason that I grew those crops um, was very focused on who was buying them. So I was always, the result of all of that is that I got more sales on fewer types of flowers. So I grew less different types of flowers and grew more of the ones that I did grow. And that is just called simplification, y'all. And there is like a ripple effect of the benefits of that. There surely there's cons too, but the benefits definitely outweighed the cons. Um, so that really allows you to potentially have more profit on those crops. When you're growing more of anything, volume is what makes money. That's why, I mean, I could just go down a rabbit hole on that, but I won't. Let's just take, for instance, um, you know, when you are a big retailer, let's just talk about, like, say, somebody like L.L. Bean um, or Amazon, all of those huge companies that are selling bazillions of dollars, they pay so much less for shipping, for instance, than I do. 
I mean, we're both using the same supplier and they pay like 30% of what I pay. So if I pay $10 to send you a box, they pay three or $4 to send that box. Do you see what I mean? Volume, that is just one example, one BB in the Astrodome. Um, and that's why the more you sell, the more you make. It's not just that you're making more because you're selling more. It's that everything, all of your costs, when you focus on simplifying, go down typically. So I would sell, make more sales at fewer different types of flowers. And this would really make my profit margin um, high. I mean, another a great example for me would be those sunflowers that you guys have started with me every single week, you know, during the season when we do that together live. Um, you know, those sunflowers, particularly now that I started starting the seeds, used to be for many years, I didn't do that. Somebody else did. Well, I even removed that little piece of labor. So I began sowing those weekly sunflower seeds when the pandemic hit so that I could have some company. I mean, I was here on the farm by myself in the beginning, you know, back when we didn't know what to do or how to do it because we were so afraid of everybody getting sick. So I started doing it myself thought, shoot, I need somebody to talk to, started doing, um, you know, meet me on the porch, I think is what I named it. So I removed the cost of that labor of somebody doing that. And guess what, friends? I was marketing my business by doing it. You know, I mean, sunflowers, um, that volume of sunflowers, there was so much trickle down of benefits to my business. Um, so, we can't go down these rabbit holes. All right. So I was making more on making a higher profit on growing fewer types. I mean, y'all, I'm still growing 30 different, at least more than that, probably more like 40. I don't know the number. I didn't look it up. Um, and in addition to making more profit, you just get better at growing that stuff. I mean, how do you think I came around to the realization that those sunflowers again, that we don't need to plant those sunflowers into beds that have Bio 360 on them. That's the biodegradable film that we use primarily on the majority of our beds, which just changed our weed suppression life. Um, I'm in the midst, you know, of writing that book and I am writing the weed prevention portion of it and, or my practices of weed prevention, I should say. And I had just forgotten how significant Bio360 impacted my farm and life. And anyway, so what I realized by starting sunflowers every single week and growing so many of them is that, you know what, when we plant the sunflowers at three weeks old, they're already a third of their life in. Then we plant them, they grow quickly. We hand water them to get them well established and when we plant them. But then we pretty much leave them on their own. All of that was a result of I grew so many and I think probably a couple of times we did it this way because we were desperate and guess what? They did great. We don't film them. We don't put irrigation down and we don't net them. Three things that I do primarily for everything else that I grow I learned that I did not need to do that with sunflowers. The profit just went through the roof when all of that was figured out. Yes, we lose some to going down. Um, anyway, so you get better at growing when you're only focusing on a few different crops versus 50 different crops. And if you think that's an exaggeration, I know people that are growing five feet of 50 different things and thinking they're going to make money. And it just doesn't work that way. And then marketing and selling also gets easier. It allowed me to target those people that pigeonholed into buying more <coughs> of a fewer things. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the other part of this is, particularly if you have people working for you, um, when you become the best at growing fewer things, there's just less screw-ups. There's less mistakes. Every, I mean, it's like, you know, Bobo could plant sunflowers in her sleep, 
literally. The, spa- the spacing, the, the everything about how to do it because she is as familiar with it as I am, right? And then the other part that, I mean, it's just a basic business concept is that typically we make 80% of our money off of 20% of what we sell. That's just in every business. That's not flower farming. So you need to look at that and find out what is that for your business. And the things that I gravitated to were that 20% of the flowers that I was growing that were making 80% of the money, right? So here's what I did. First off, and this is where people, and I understand it, but y'all have to understand that I really felt like my hands were tied all those years ago. It was pretty lonely not having social media and instant contact with people. Um, You know, when I, this is my 25th year, y'all, the internet is not but like 27 years old or something like that, I think. For actually, for for like the average home to have had access to internet and computers, right? Um, I didn't even have the opportunity to learn about all the tips and tricks. You kind of had to figure that all out for yourself. So I first, I realize now, targeted the crops that I could grow well. And that... That meant what I could get access to, what my conditions would allow me to grow them in. And then the second part of that is, number two, is to grow those crops that I felt like I could grow well. You know, I mean, it's really easy to grow something and it kind of does well to make it better and then to make it easier and then to make it more profitable And here, I want you to read between the lines about what I'm getting ready to say. If you read between the lines, this basically is me saying, and to do it in the cheapest way possible, is I would grow those crops that would grow in my environment, in my conditions, in the most natural way, a.k.a. the less inputs from me, better known as the less the least amount of money that they needed. You know what I mean? It's like the I focused in on those crops that, you know what, in spite of me and my screw ups and my and y'all, I am so far from being the grower that people think I am. I mean, I just yesterday, we've been waiting like two years, two seasons, um, for prairie sun rudbeckia seed to come back into stock. I mean, that is literally um, one of my most favorite Rudbeckias. It's the green-eyed one, right? And, I mean, it is the most versatile, strong grower. It is the best little garden grower ever. I first met Prairie Sun in a parking lot at a grocery store where they had planted it at a brand new U-Crops grocery store in those little medians that they have out in the parking lot amongst the asphalt. Prairie Sun performed all summer in that little skinny median with no water, no mulch, bloomed her little head off for the longest period of time. I fell in love with Prairie Sun then, and we've been married ever since, right? Well, the seed has not been available for two seasons. I have sorely missed it. Well, we got the seed back in, so you can find it on our website. But this is me screwing up. So Bobo, we just got the seed. And so Bobo started it last week. Well, guess who forgot to water her? Because we basically usually don't have any transplants going at this time of the year. So I had these just emerging seedlings or seeds and I forgot to water them. And even in spite of me, 99% of them germinated and they're still doing great. But I walked out there yesterday and it's like, oh my gosh, totally forgot that there were even seedlings in this room. I never even came out here and watered on Saturday or Sunday. And the room is pretty bright and sunny. Anyway, so I tend to grow those flowers 
that really just don't need a lot of intercession from me. And then the the third part of this equation is that I grow the flowers that my most dependable buyers will buy every single day of their life. And what does that mean? That means that for all these years that I was selling to, and this also came from doing volume, during the height of our high production years, I was selling to 23 different florists from Virginia Beach, Virginia to Williamsburg, Virginia. I live kind of in the middle of those two areas. And, you know, you learn a lot about the florist trade when you're doing that. I mean, first off, you learn who not to sell to. Very interesting. Um, But I um, learned kind of what what would they buy every week? And I know that you've probably heard me say that the other part, and this is what led to that part of my business, standing orders, um, which is orders that florists just say, all right, bring me $500 a week. And they might add something like, but don't bring me this. You know, like some people say, do not bring me marigolds. Other people say, bring me everything. Anything you have, they appreciated variety and new things. Um, And so standing orders are the flowers that florists, commercial growers, and even supermarkets, uh, floral departments, use every single day in their business. I never focused on having special colors or special flowers for events. That in itself is kind of like a niche, right? And that was never my niche because the majority of those really needed those that extra input that I spoke of that I just never was, I didn't think I was able to actually give flowers that back then. I didn't realize all the tips and tricks that I could have, in fact, done stuff to make that possible. But what I learned you know, going down this journey of just kind of growing what grew naturally best for me in my conditions. And then I looked for who was the most reliable buyer because, and this is what gets me back to what my student was speaking of yesterday, was they're worried. They thought that their sales were falling off this past year. Well, first off, if, you're, if you've been selling for less than five years, you really don't even have your hand on the market yet, right? It just simply takes time and volume of selling to really figure any of that out. And I feel like so often, sometimes if you have instant success in a particular market, then we tend to maybe just kind of focus there and not um, ride the wave, but the wave dies down. Does that make sense? Um, So I grew what naturally grew for me, cheap. And then I um, looked for the customers that wanted those flowers. And they wanted them every day of their business life because here is the bottom line. And I think of this Um, As you know, the economy is shaky, right? Um, The thing about when you're the staple flower supplier with a standing order, perhaps or not, but when you're selling the flowers that a commercial customer uses every day in their life, guess what? I mean, the sad fact is people are still dying They still need funeral flowers. They are still screwing up. They still need I'm sorry flowers. They may not be doing a lot of parties. They may not be doing a lot of weddings, but they're still going to be doing the day-to-day business flowers that I sold my flowers for. And, you know, I've talked about this so many different times, but people still just don't think it's possible. And we get so intoxicated, right, with all of the the variety, and I'm not saying that I don't grow a variety of flowers of those flowers that I do grow. I'm just saying that I niche down. I hammer down on those things that I found to be 
the very most profitable. And they were profitable because they were the everyday flowers. Because the bottom line is that, um, you know, being in business for the long haul, making a profit, being successful is not about fireworks every day. It's about getting up and working in the trenches and the ditches day after day and with the hope that at the end of the journey each year that you brought in more money than you spent and you enjoyed the journey. And that's kind of what I did. And if and it's I'm I felt like I wanted to say this now because we're planning, right? We're we're planning our garden. It is so hard to make choices. But guess what, friends? As a business owner, you have to make a lot of hard decisions. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't test. Like, for instance, um, just thinking to myself, because I was looking at my plan yesterday, how many different colors of Gumpfrina am I going to grow this year? Well, Gumpfrina is always a great seller. I mean, bouquet making, it is a boom, you know, for that. We always could sell it to our commercial customers, especially when it's cut and harvested properly and in a way that it's easy for the florist to use. And I don't know. So if I, what I would do in that case would say, all right, I'm going to have, let's just say I, this is backtrack to four years ago when we were still growing for our big CSA, which was our members only um, CSA type selling, which was our members only market and our bouquet subscription. I would say, all right, you know, I succession plant Gumpfrina like three times a year probably. All right, I'm going to have 25 feet of Gumpfrina. So there's your unity. You're growing that Gumpfrina. Then you can break that 25 feet up into how many different colors you want. Do I want to grow three colors or five colors? It doesn't really matter. But to start at the, looking at the 30,000 foot view of, all right, I'm going to have um, five. I mean, we used to grow a lot of zinnias because you may have heard me say this before. I feel like I haven't said it in a long time. It took me a lot of years, y'all, to realize, I mean, to come to this conclusion that I've just shared with you. And one of the most standout moments um, was when I, back in the days when I used to grow a big lily program and um, oh my goodness, I would grow, I grew LA hybrids, which were a little different than what my florist could get. And I mean, we, we'd sell out every week, but they were a lot of additional labor and expense to grow them. Anyway, um, I can remember it was some, I had grown some Orientals in fact, which I didn't grow those very often. And I remember how beautiful they were. And we had some open at our members only market, so when customers came in, they could see them. And then, of course, we had them unopened for them to get them home to open in their vase, right? So I can remember a customer walking in, longtime customer, um, been a member of our market for our private market for years, um, walking in. And I said, um, Judy, come over here and look at this lily. And she came over and said, I mean, she just went on and on and on. She gushed. She thought it was so very beautiful. And then she turned around and looked at the buckets of zinnias that were in our big market splash and said, I'll take two dozen zinnias, please. And that was the beginning of my understanding. Judy would have bought those lilies if she was going to have company for dinner, maybe, or something else. But to her, in that situation, and she was a pretty high fluting girl, um, and she had zinnias in her house all the time. And then she would, some weeks she would come and she would buy lilies or something else in addition, you know, when the dahlias would be blooming or the tuberoses or whatever. But every single week, she bought two dozen zinnias. And and then I actually listened to my baby sister, and don't anybody tell her this, because I'm pretty sure she doesn't listen to the podcast. She listens to me all day, every day, um, that 
she would always say, because Suzanne ran our members only market and led the team making bouquets or she made bouquets for our subscriptions. She said, we never, ever, ever have enough big, beautiful zinnias. And that's why you succession plant. And that's why you just keep planting them. And sometimes it is those simplest flowers that float the biggest boat. And that's all I'm going to say about any of this, friends. I am going to sign off. So, friends, if you have dropped a review here, I again want to just express my deep felt thanks to you. If you haven't and you're enjoying the podcast, that is the number one thing you can do. It doesn't have to be but one word. You don't even have to write it much. It's just reviewing the podcast. That bumps the podcast um, app platform to show my podcast to more people. So it's like you're paying with no money, friends. It's just hitting a button. And I thank you. I read every one of them. And yes, I did read that one too. You know who you are. And I appreciate you being here. And remember, you can learn more about the work the Gardener's Workshop is doing over on our website and find just a whole bunch of great resources over there. And maybe join me for the live shopping show, um, which is a ton of fun, y'all. And as we're heading into January, February, and March, I'm sure I'll be doing a ton of seeds, starting sowing seeds. And then once the flowers start, it is a beautiful show. That show is all about showing the harvest, y'all, each and every week. And you can get the details on that and learn about our app. You can search your phone app store for the Gardener's Workshop Live Shop. Download it on your phone and you can join us on there and it's a ton of fun. All right, friends, until we meet again, happy new year and ciao.